And now, here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaping Success. I am your host, Wes Tankersley. We have an awesome guest for you today, another musical artist that, uh, you know, I like interviewing him because I love music and I love being moved by it. And this guy is very passionate about what he's do, what he does. I'm super excited to have him. He is the lead singer of a band called The Circle View. He's had a couple bands and, and um, he's been through a lot, of, a lot of musical transitions and things like that. And it's a really cool story. So let's get Lance Errors in here. All right, Lance, round hey, two. Hey, what's we up, go. guys? <laughs> there we go. How's it going, guys? How's everybody doing today? Yeah, this is this is a treat. You know, it's always exciting to get to talk to a music artists. Um, I just it just feels like I'm I'm not I don't have a music bone in my body I, other than the listening, you know. But it is really cool to, you know, talk to people who are passionate about music. So, yeah, I, I think that's the that's the beautiful thing about music that you know we have that in common. We both really love music and it, it, it just brings people together man and you know there there was a time on this earth where something like this on every possible level we were just talking about technology but on every possible level something like this wasn't even possible so i'm just grateful to be here yeah i'm just grateful we, to be here the the conversation about the technology just is kind of funny to me because we were talking like the first thing that i ever did with technology was play organ trail or number munchers you know like the old apple computer and the floppy disk and all that stuff so it's Oh my God! I remember the single joystick. That's how. That's how. That's where. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah. You know, the single joystick and the red button. The Atari. And it was like, it was like you know Elon Musk to have that game system in my house. You know, so right. it was crazy. You know. Yeah, my cousin oh my still goodness. had when I was. Gosh, I bet it's still sitting in his old bedroom at my aunt's house. But he had an Atari, and he had you know it was just the same thing. That little joystick, the the orange button, red button. Man, fun times. <laughs> fun times. Oh my god. I played so many I think my favorite one was uh um it, it was it's so basic, man, but it was like two little pads that slide oh, yeah. up and down and you're yep. just you're basically playing ping pong. Pong. I could play that thing all day. Yeah. Pong. There it is. Yeah. I could play that all day, man. But yeah, it's it's just you know I don't I don't like I don't like allowing people to make me feel well, because I don't feel as old as I am, but I will say this, I will say this. My mom lived until she was 52. She died seven days before her birthday. My biological father made it to 56. So biologically speaking, I'm doing okay. I yeah. feel good. I feel healthy. I feel, if I can make it to 60, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's the tits, man. I'm just, <laughs> I'm riding like, I'm riding a wave for the rest of my life, man. Yeah. So I don't, I don't let people make me feel bad for getting older. It's, yeah. it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's crazy though. Right. Like, because I know you have young kids and I got young kids and I'm just sitting there like, man, this, I, so I didn't have kids until I was. Oh, my daughter's 10 and I'm 43. So 33 when we had her, but then we were like, we're done. We're only having one. And then I, and then, well, my son came along. <laughs> he's, he's two. And I will tell you what, an eight year difference between having kids. It is aging. <laughs> it is, it is. And I, you know, um, that's funny that you mentioned that because my older brother is eight years older than me. Uh -huh. So I definitely understand that. I definitely understand that. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird, man. Well, tell us a little bit about, about you to, you know, I mean, you, you are a jack of all instruments. I feel like, um, we were talking a little bit before when the, we had a little technical difficulties with myself and, um, you started out playing the piano, you said. Right. So starting from the beginning, um, I started at about four and a half. And um, I'll tell the story real quick. I, they, ha they had a young performers competition on television. And I, I want to say it was a young Japanese or maybe Chinese or Korean young girl. She might have been nine or ten years old. And she was just blazing on the piano, a classical piece. And I'm told this story from my mom. So I don't, I, you know, I, don't, I couldn't tell you this from memory. But my mom told the story to me all the time. She said, you, she, I walked into the kitchen and I pulled her into the living room and I pointed to the TV and I said, I want to do that, you know? And she took that as a sign. Here, and here's another sign. 
on the block that we we lived on this block with um we lived in an apartment building we lived on the third floor there was a main street like we we lived at, right at the edge of the block and on, and across the street from that main street was a piano store mm-hmm. we went to the piano store and she asked if um the, the, it was a woman that owned the store and she asked if they gave piano lessons and the woman said my um son teaches piano lessons and my mom worked it out and she bought me an organ and got me lessons so i got to start taking piano lessons a little bit sooner than normal because you're they're really not supposed to start until five yeah so i banged on that thing for about a year and it and it just sort of progressed from there and i got more acquainted with music and music theory and right around high school fast forward to high school i stuck with it um what i had a number of different music teachers depending on the weather um because travel was a a big deal for us when i was younger um we didn't always have a car we had to take the bus stuff like that so by the time i got to high school i went to luther i went to a lutheran high school luther south in chicago and it was a great school it was it was an interracial school it was a lot of different kids it was a lot of it, it exposed me to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different family types and i had i had friends of all shapes and colors and it was great and we all were band geeks. We were all band nerds. So I learned saxophone. I learned drums. I learned, you know, I picked up all this stuff from all these different people while I was still taking piano lessons. And on top of that, I grew up in the Baptist church. So my my biological father's mother, my grandmother on my father's side was a master keyboardist. She could play anything, but she blazed on the organ. So we had all assumed that that's where the natural talent came from, came from my grandmother on my father's side. And um, so I, I had, I was, I was getting exposed to all of, all of this different, you know, all of these different types of musical culture. And like I said, I had, I had um, um, a lot of friends that introduced me to music that I wouldn't have necessarily been exposed to. The same thing goes for my brother. But my brother, if, if I had to name a person, a single person, my brother had the biggest influence on me musically because he was my older brother and he was eight years older than me and he was my God. He was <laughs> Everything listening to my some brother cool did shit. was, <laughs> yeah, he was listening to the coolest shit, man. Yeah. And um, so everything I learned about music, popular music, I learned from my brother. He introduced me to to Zeppelin. He introduced me to Cream. He introduced me to Bowie. He introduced me to Prince. He introduced me to Jimi Hendrix. He introduced me to Al Green, Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, all the greats. All anybody that's considered a great. And if they were in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I learned about it from my brother. So um, one day, I'm trying. I'm like, I'm giving you chunks as no, fast as I can here. Yep. W- one day, um, I'm. Mm, um, my brother, his ritual was that he would listen to music in the bathroom because that was his sanctuary because we shared a room and he couldn't have his own space. He would go to the bathroom, open the window in the middle of the afternoon, especially in the summertime. And he had a boom box and he would just blast his music. And um, he would just love to just, and I would hear him just like dancing around in there. And, and one day he put on this guy and it was this this driving groove um and i was like who is this guy man you know and um i finally snuck into his room and he had he listened to a lot of stuff on cassette tape but he had a lot of vinyl so i snuck into his room and i was sneaking around and i finally found who he was listening to and it was this guy named prince and it was a song called Controversy. And I was like looking at the album cover and that, and I was not, I was not really allowed in Ryan's section of the room. Mm-hmm. His room was off, his part of the room was off limits, you know? So I was like sneaking around in there and I was like reading through all the vinyls and all that stuff. And finally, I just kind of like approached him, like, who is this guy? And he told me everything that he could about Prince. He just sort of explained them to me. And my mom, was not initially was not having it she was like hell 
to the fuck no. You are yeah. not listening to that he guy. Was an odd you're like dude. eight years. <laughs> yeah, you're like eight years old. Why the fuck are you trying to listen yeah. to this guy? You know. So, long story short, um, I think it was, and this was this was approaching eighty four when Prince like really blew up. And I'm just getting caught up on this guy. And in the meantime, I'm listening to Bowie and I'm listening to Jimi Hendrix and I'm listening to all this other stuff. And finally, and then, you know, obviously Michael Jackson was like a huge deal back then. And I had the red jacket and my brother hated that I had the red jacket. He's like, you're a total Michael Jackson. It it, it was like the total Prince. I think a lot of people built that Prince Michael Jackson rivalry up themselves. And it never really was a thing between the actual Prince and Michael Jackson. So my brother was like, oh, you're just a Michael Jackson nut. You know, you don't really like Prince. And I was like, oh, I, you know, and then and then all of a sudden he drops Purple Rain. And all of my friends are talking about Purple Rain. All of my friends in school are talking about this Purple Rain, Prince and Purple Rain. I'm like, you guys didn't even know anything about Prince. I knew about <laughs> Prince before you did, you know. So I go home and I'm like, I, you know, I asked my mom, I'm like, you need to take me to see this movie. I asked my mom to take me to see this movie. So she takes me, there used to be a movie theater in Chicago called Evergreen Plaza, Mm -hmm. in, in in a mall called Evergreen Plaza. And I think it was called the Evergreen Plaza Theater. And my mom agreed to take me there. And she, um, she was very reluctant to do this, but I pleaded and begged and pleaded. And I think I think my aunts had a little bit to do with it too. They kind of like they were like, "All right, just just take him to see the movie. It'll, you know, he's a growing boy. It'll be a good experience right. for him, you know." Uh, you know, and so I she took me to the movie theater, and I remember just being like blown away. I was like, "This is the greatest dude to have ever walked the face of the earth." I don't care what anybody else says. Prince is the bee's knees, man. I'm trying not to curse too much on your podcast. I'm no, a cursor. I, I use a lot of profanity. But I am um, too. <laughs> this dude is this dude is the shit, man. He was blowing my mind. So the long and short of it is, you know, I he um he has this like wild sex, like it's not even really a sex scene, but you know, when you're like 10 years old, you know, I think fast forward a couple of years, I think I was 10 when I, maybe 11, I don't, I don't fucking know, time is, it's, I'm, time doesn't exist in my world anymore, I have two kids, man, I'm <laughs> right. too old for this shit, so anyway, <laughs> I was, I was a kid, the point is, I was a kid, my mom was like, holding my eyes uh, over the, the semi-sex scene, like, nowadays, they, that would be considered tame, that sex scene, yeah, there's nothing but my mom was covering my eyes, <laughs> nothing happening, He's like, you know, tickling the badge a little bit through the clothes. Nothing, you know. Yep. But my mom was not having it. So she was covering my eyes. And I I didn't get to see that actual scene until I was much older. I remember not being able to see that scene until I was much And then I finally saw the scene. And I was like, that's it? That's what you were, like, hiding from me? <laughs> this is what I've been waiting for? So <laughs> I know, you know. So I remember seeing that movie and I was done. It was a wrap. And then, so I, at that point, I was like, I need to learn everything about this dude. Because even up until that point, I didn't know that he wrote all the songs. I didn't know that on a lot of his earlier albums, he played all the instruments. I didn't know that he was, he was producing and mixing his own stuff. This, this is like unheard of in, in, that, in that time, that era, you know. Now it's commonplace if you got one of these. You How know, do you figure that out though, was, like at that time? Because you know, I mean, we had we have the internet now, but we didn't that, like at that time there was no internet. Like, I mean, were you going to the library? Were you looking for books? Were you reading magazines? What's the I'm under the impression, and I'm just I'm just spitballing here, but I'm under the impression that Prince was like from the fucking Zeta Reticuli system or something. <laughs> that dude was like a fucking alien from another world. Because I genuinely don't know how he was able to pull that stuff off. But there are multiple people corroborating the story. People who were women, mostly women. He, he preferred female co- like engineers in the room to help him with the technical aspect of making sure the board was working properly and making sure. Suzanne Rogers, the list goes on and on and on of female engineers who worked with him. They all said the same thing. Like, we'd walk in. There'd be notes on the board with what we need to do. We'd get it set up. He'd walk in. He'd go, okay, 
Oh, all right, thank you. And we'd leave, and then come back, and then fucking side of the times was recorded <laughs> or some shit like that it's just like how did he do how was yeah. he doing that you know so i was just upset i I'm, I'm there's no was i am i i am and always will be obsessed with this man because he is the pinnacle to me he is the pinnacle of a complete and total artist in every possible way and a lot of people don't really talk about this but he was innovative on, in, in, in the technology realm as well. Not a lot of people know this, but Prince was the first person ever to sell his music online. Ever. Nobody knows. I'm like, how do did, how did people not know that? How, how is that a thing? But he was the first person to make his music available for download online. The dude was an innovator on so many levels. And it's just, yeah. it like boggles the mind. And as a guitar player, myself i'd always looked to people like eric clapton and jimmy hendrix and jimmy page and the list goes on and on of the 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 you know the namesakes of all that is guitar goddom you know right. i would look to those guys for inspiration and and then all of a sudden you know there's this guy and he just keeps proving himself over and over and over and the thing that i like about him the most is that um he never really he never really um succumbed to the the criticism of well prince is overrated prince is this prince is that he just kept making great music and playing and kept doing his thing and you know he was a fantastic dancer fantastic um you know um entertainer he had like a six octave vocal range did all this stuff and then on top of that He's this incredible guitar player. Now, I've seen this guy do stuff on guitar because I've seen Prince Alive about seven times. I've seen him do on film and in, in person, in real life, I've seen him do things on guitar that I've never seen Jimmy Page do. I've never seen Eric Clapton do. I've never seen some of my favorite guitar players, even Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie Ray Vaughan is like, he like tickles the funny <laughs> bone of all that is that goes in your ear holes, yeah. you know? And I'm, I'm Prince just, he was just in a whole class by himself. The time I think about it, someone asked me, who who's your absolute number one favorite person? And that would be him. So with that being said, he had a very, very uh, intricate influence, very crucial influence on my musical upbringing. He was always the main say, well, how would Prince approach this? How would Prince do this? How? I was always reading what he wrote. I was always like, um, you know, checking out his interviews. I was always just so big influence, but not the only influence, mm -hmm. but the biggest. And then I listened to, I listened to a lot of, of Bowie growing up. I listened to a lot of um, the Beatles growing up and the Stones. I listened to a lot of, um, and as I got older, I met, I, I met incredible friends who introduced me to music that I probably wouldn't have even considered like Rush and Tool and Dream Theater and all of these amazing bands that I'm just like, uh, yeah, gobble, 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 gimme, gimme, right. gimme, cookie, cookie, cookie. You know, I'm just, I'm absorbing it all so that I can find a way because we as artists, we're, we're in this constant state of trying to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. Us, the best version of us. I don't want to be Lance, who is emulating David Bowie, or Lance, who is imitating the Beatles. I, I just want to be me. And I think the best artists find a way. They all did. They all did. The Beatles, the Stones, you know, the Who, all these guys, they all have found a way to, to take a little piece of all the stuff that they're hearing around them and turn it into something that is genuinely them. And that's right. all I've been trying to do pretty much my whole life, you know. Well, we talk um, but a lot I think about... the one... I talk a lot about like collaboration, right? Like there's this thing where everyone thinks that they all have this original idea, right? But what I think that's great about music is that you can pull those things into what you're doing and you can sound like, I, I, I did listen to one of your songs. I was like, you sound, that sounds like Ben Harper to me. That's super cool. And then you, you play something else and it sounds like something else. And it's just like, it's, I love it because there's all this, like, I got this from here and I got that from there. And, and you're creating your own thing, but using these tools that you, that you found. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much what it is, man. It's like, um, 
inspiration comes from so many different places and it comes from um, from so many different people and um, when a person when a person listens to my song or you know any particular song and like tonight I'm gonna be I'm gonna be going on doing a TikTok live and the the goal of tonight's TikTok is to talk about my songs and the influences mm-hmm. from the songs and and the, and I got the inspiration from the last TikTok I was on people were asking me about the songs so I was like okay you know I'll tell them about it. so I was like oh, you know I could do a whole TikTok about that yeah um one song in particular epilogue um is a very you know it's a very moving story about the last the last great lesson of my mother to me and my brother and you know um my biggest influence at the time musically was tool Mm -hmm. and so i explained to the tiktok audience at the time this is what i was listening to now i want you to listen to the song again i played tool and then i said i want you to listen to my song again and see if you can hear the influence and I was like, that's a great idea. I'm going to do a whole TikTok. Like that's that, awesome. You know? And, um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things where I, you know, I listen to, I listen to different things and I, I, I went into detail about it. For example, um, the song is sober. And I was talking about how in that song, how Maynard, you almost got to lean in a little bit to hear what he's talking about. His vocals are purposefully buried in the mix a little bit. Because he 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 actually talks about this in interviews sometimes. He doesn't he doesn't do a lot of them. But when you he does talk, it's really crazy. It's it's awesome stuff. But he likes to um he 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 wants his vocals to be a part of the tapestry. It's just another color on the canvas. It's not it's not meant to be like a stage setting where he's standing out front and you can hear him clearly, and then everybody else is like sort of behind him. And accompaniment, it's sort of like this interwoven painting, almost EDM, like blow your mind visually kind of situation, only musically. And I was like, that's some fascinating shit. I want to do that, you know? Right. And so I think I kind of overdid it with my song to the point where you almost can't even hear what I'm saying in the song. But I really like that aspect of his approach to his vocals in that song. So I did it in my song. And I just sort of explained to people what I was doing, and the meaning of the song, the inspiration behind the song, and so on and so forth. So yeah, man, music. That's my shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome, man. Well, tell us a little bit about, so you've had a couple different bands, but right now the current one is the Circle View, right? Like, I mean, has that always been around, yes. or is that just the latest iteration of what you're doing? Or um, So what happened was... <laughs> um. It started off, I started off as a solo artist, and then I had a band in college called the Red Meat Trio, and it was, it was mostly like some jazz. I played a number of different genres because I'm a piano player, so I was in a jazz band called the Red Meat Trio, and then it moved on to um, the Bow Boys, and that's, that's my grandfather's nickname, so that was like a jam band with a horn section, and then my mom died. And then I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something because I was, I was just, the truth of the matter is, is I was just fucking pissed. I was angry at the world and I wanted my music to reflect that. So I started a band called ODM. And that's kind of where this sort of current iteration of the music stemmed from. I wanted to do something a little bit more hard rock, a little bit more edgy. Um, I wanted to talk about what I was feeling because prior to my mom's death, I, you know, I didn't know shit. I was a kid, so I just talked about happy shit all the time. You know, that's what you talk about when you're a songwriter. You talk about what you know. And um, I wanted to write music that was re- reflecting the pain. So ODM didn't last, as a name, ODM didn't last very long because I started to realize that there were a lot of things called ODM, you know. Um, and so I said, okay, okay, so how about we name the band ODM Nation? So we named, we renamed the band Odium Nation, and we were that for a while. And that was at the pinnacle of that band's sort of success rise. We were like, we were drawing like anywhere between eighty to one hundred and fifty people per show, um, and that was great. It was fantastic. But then we started to get uh, along with that comes record deal opportunities and notoriety and stuff like that. So at the time, but still, it, it nothing's changed. I I write. I write most, if not all, of the material. 
I do all of the arranging. I typically play a lot. If if I'm feeling it, I'll play all the instruments myself on a recording, stuff like that. Yeah. The band members at the time, which none of them are in, in the circle view. It was a completely different band back then. But the band members at the time were getting frustrated with me because the you know the the requirements started to mount. I start. I wanted to. I wanted to. De- I, my basic concept was simply this: if I'm going to be sharing any success with you, I feel like we need to like delegate some responsibility here. I kind of feel like I shouldn't be doing everything, and you guys get to like share in the spoils. You just show up and do what the hell I tell you to do, right. and then like if we get a record deal, everybody's going to get a cut because everybody's name's going to be on the on the contract. So. Don't you think you guys should delegate? I should, I'm just trying to delegate. They were not having that. They were like, no, nah, fuck that. Um, so we had this big argument, and I learned something new that day. I learned something about the Illinois version of the Uniform Partnership Act, which states that if a person was present at the inception of a band, then they, and no contract was signed, then they have a stake a legitimate stake in the success of the band regardless of whether or not they did shit yeah just as long as they were there at the inception of the band they have a say they have a cut so me being the 20 20 something year old hothead that i was i said okay then you can have the band and i'm gonna start a whole new band <laughs> and go on because i knew i wrote all the songs you did it all i write all the songs i'm the lead yeah, i did everything so i said you take these songs and go find another lead singer and you guys continue on as odm nation and i'm gonna start a whole new band and do some a whole new shit because that is some bullshit you know um and they were very very upset with my response um and so we broke up and from there is when I said I took about I took about a year off, and then I said I just want to start fresh. I want to start something new and something different. And I had to sit down with my lawyer, my 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 lawyer, my entertainment lawyer at the time. His name was Joseph Madonia, and he said, uh, he said, "So let me get this straight. You wrote all of those songs." I was like, "Yeah." He said, "You you played most of the instruments on all those songs." I was like, "Yeah." He's like, so the songs are your copyrights in your name? He's like, so just change the fucking name of the band and just just re-release all the shit as the Circle View. Yeah. What the fuck are you doing? Like, just, just keep the music. They didn't take the music. It's your music. You offered it to them. They didn't take it. So take those songs, re- retool the band. He's like, nobody even knows who the fuck you are. Like, a handful of people in Chicago know who you are. The world doesn't know who you are. So what difference does it make if it's called Odium Nation or the Circle View or whatever? Take that stuff, turn it into the Circle View, and move on, and everything you create from now on, make it the Circle View. So I was like, that's a great fucking idea. Yeah. So that's exactly what I did. So I took the I took the one album that I did with Odium Nation, and I made it a Circle View album, and everything after that was a, a, was a Circle View album. And I held... A, I held a, um, and I met a bunch of different, you know, on my band exploits, I've met a bunch of different musicians that I'd wanted to work with over the years. And one happened to come to my auditions and that was Tom Howell. And I had, I known that he wanted to be in the band. I wouldn't have even held fucking guitar auditions because that dude was a badass from the beginning. I remember seeing him playing with his other band. I'm like, this fucking dude is amazing. So he auditioned he actually legitimate didn't tell me he was coming he just showed up and auditioned for the band i was like auditions are over you got the guy you got the gig you know and we just moved forward and we had a different bass player at the time and you know he moved on and then we found chris and uh, the only thing that's sort of a continuing revolving door with the circle view is the drummer situation and that's a whole different that's a whole different podcast <laughs> I genuinely could do a whole different podcast on the drummer thing, but I'm not going to go there. But yeah, the I mean, you know, it's, it's weird, man. It's a weird time of the mind. Like one half of my brain, it's one of the reasons why I've, I'm releasing a solo album in the spring. Because one half of my brain knows that I have the capacity to do it all myself. But the other half of my brain grew up on 
the Beatles and the Stones and Prince and the Revolution and all these bands and 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 Tool and Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Foo Fighters, all these bands. All the, I love that idea of collaborating with people musically. Right. I love that idea of this sort of musical democracy. You walk into a room and somebody shares an idea and we create something that's bigger than us. I've always been attracted to that. So I said this year in 2024, I'm going to have the best of fucking both worlds. I'm going to do me and it's going to just be me. I'm going to do the total Prince thing, something that I've always wanted to do because I've idolized this guy my whole life for that. And I, I committed to it and I completed it. I did from the rooter to the tutor, man. I did everything <laughs> from song conception all the way to mastering. Nobody touched the soul album. It's all me. That's the awesome. circle view is slightly different. I'm doing, I'm doing, I'd say a, a lion's share of the work on the, the next circle view album, but Tom's going to be playing guitar a little bit. There's going to be some Chris bass on there. I'm playing all the drums on the circle view album. So there's no, again, whole other podcast (laughs) um but i'm doing all the drums on the next circle view album um and it's mostly because you know that male ego wes i tell you it's it's a fucking thing you know it's a thing in the music industry so we won't get into it too too much but i feel like the drummer is always the odd man in the whole deal anyway so that's that's all we'll leave it at right there (laughs) <laughs> we'll leave it there we'll leave it there we'll save but that yeah for it's gonna be podcast. great I'm, please please and it's gonna i'm coming i'm coming with the fire too so let me know when you're ready to talk drummers because oh, i got yeah. i got it oh man crazy stuff man crazy stuff yeah. but in the meantime since then we've, we've got to tour i've i've got to see all of my country which i'm really grateful for i've gotten to see parts of africa um i've gotten to see some of canada i've gotten to, you know to really branch out and play my music for an assortment of different people all over um this great country of ours and um everywhere i've gone the reception has been pretty good yeah um i'd say if i had to give it a number i'd say the reception has been a solid 90 90 solid a um I think if I think if the band were a little bit more concrete, I, if if there weren't revolving door a revolving door situation with the band members, I think people would be a little would gravitate towards us a little bit more. Which is one of the reasons why I've sort of changed the imagery surrounding the Circle View. I've sort of made everything. Um, and this is not a narcissistic thing. This is genuinely a marketing move. I've made everything about me and my face as the consistent thing. Mm-hmm. Because I, every time I do an album, and you'll see when you get your copy of the stuff, every time I do a new album, there's a different face on the, on the record. I'm like, who's this fucking guy? You know? And after a while, people get kind of like tired of that shit. And they're like, well, is the band him or is it just a bunch of him and a bunch of people that he just keeps surrounding himself with and he just calls it the circle view there are consistent band members of the circle view tom howell being one of them chris mckenna on bass um justin shields on um you know keyboards and effects so those are my main guys right now the only issue is the drummer thing and i'm, I'm trying to nail down somebody that's gonna like really stick with the group you know, and really follow us into the fire, you know, but right now it's just, you know, I'm just looking forward to releasing new music and seeing how people respond to it. It's going to be good. Yeah. Oh, I'm interested because, you know, I've, I've listened to a bunch of it. Like one day you were talking on TikTok about the amount of money that you make off of just a play on Spotify. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to get this guy some play on Spotify because I, you know, I've got a bunch of the albums on my Apple music and I just go and I play and I don't ever like, I get lost in the fact of like listening to the name of the song, but I'm listening. Oh, that's pretty good. You know, I like that. Like we played one on the motivational music hour the other day. And it was funny because I bet it was, I bet you wrote it right after your mom passed away because you're like, I had a, I had a few anger issues on that one. <laughs> you were listening to it. With us, <laughs> yeah. and it was like, yeah, that's gotta be it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, um, um, actually, I think I know that it's the one where I'm saying, I don't give a shit about your, your effing feelings. <laughs> That's it. That's the one. <laughs> okay. So it's funny that you mentioned that because that whole story that I told you about the band breaking up, that's what that song is about. 
Oh, okay. That's that I was I was so fired up about like, you know, how how dare you guys come at me with these partnership act crap when you know damn well you've like been coming in here eating Cheetos and sitting on your ass and I'm sitting here writing like a fucking yeah. maniac trying to get shit done, you know? And then you're pissed and, um, when you have so, to yeah. contribute a little bit. I mean, that's bullshit. Right. Exactly. Like, I mean, damn it. You know, so I was, I was now with that being said, I, I remember the first podcast I went on was a buddy of mine. And I, I remember sort of like, um, feeling the need to apologize. And I still do. I still feel the need to apologize because had I been a little bit more mature, I probably would have that differently. I probably would have said, okay, this is, this is a legitimate thing. This is, you know, I respect your opinion, but I need you guys to understand my point of view. And I probably would have handled it a little differently at the time though, man, I was just pissed off and hot headed, And you know, Wes, what can I tell you, man? My mom had died. I was mad at the world anyway. Yeah. I just needed somebody to, I just needed some, I needed somebody to aim the, the cannon, you yeah. know? And uh, they just lined themselves up perfectly, you know? So that's kind of how that went. But yeah, that's, that's ad nauseum. And ad nauseum means, you know, um, uh, you can hear it, it's, it's double, there's a double meaning behind it. You know, I, I I keep hearing their bitching at me about this ad nauseum, you know, but I kept saying, I don't give a shit, I don't give a shit, I don't give a shit over and over and over again, ad nauseum in the song, yeah. to the point where it's like, is this guy okay? <laughs> you know? So there's like, there's like double meanings in within the song, but yeah, that's kind of what that's about. Um, yeah, I had issues back then, man, but I'm okay hey, now. Man, you know, the thing <laughs> is, is like, we all have issues and it's funny because it, it makes you, it makes you who you are today. Like you may have not felt sorry about the way that you acted 20 years ago, but you're like, you know, that had to happen for me to be who I am now. That had to happen for me to be where exactly. I am today. It's exactly, it's crazy. So yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, I love it. So what man. else do you want to know? That's that's let's let's call it let's be a little bit cognizant of your time here because we're I told you we're gonna be thirty we're at forty right now so we'll we will recircle Ooh. I think is what we're gonna do because I feel like that's you know, exactly what we're gonna do I love that yeah I think that what we need to do is we need to get when you get the new music out we'll we'll talk about it I think it'll be awesome to hear that new album and talk about it that's gonna be fantastic I love that idea and. Um, the, the new single is called Our Love, and it'll be out on Valentine's Day, February 14th. It's a song that I wrote for my wife. Um, there's going to be a follow-up single after that, and then the album, the full album will drop sometime in May. And then right after that, I'm not effing around, Wes. Right after that, the first The Circle View single is going to drop, and then another The Circle View single, and then The, the Circle View album is going to drop. And then it's just going to be a whole bunch of freaking live streams and shows and shit everywhere. So we're going to be, you're going to be getting tired of me after nah. a while. It's going to be like this fucking guy again. <laughs> Dude, I love seeing, like, I love seeing it. It's TikTok's one of those things I was talking about. I do a Wednesday show in the morning. I do a, I do a morning show basically is what I do. And um, Wednesday I have my friend Robert Watson on and we were talking about how um, it's just like, it's one of those things like it, it, it is gotta be there. And, um, I just, I don't know. I just, I love it. Like, I think it's exciting to hear music. I can't wait till you drop it. And the next time that you're on, you got to sing something. Yeah, man. I got guitars and shit all over yeah. here. Right? <laughs> Cause I, I, had, would, I would gladly play you guys something. Yeah. I had Jake Rose on and he sang, he, he played, uh, sleeves and it was freaking cool to just see him. He's like, Hey, you want me to play something? I'm like, that'd be awesome. And he popped it up and he played and. We got a lot of other things too. I do uh, I do a live every Wednesday you know, tonight in about hour and a half yeah. on Instagram called One Drink Wednesday, and uh, you know maybe you can hop on there sometime and you know jam out with us. It's it's an open invitation. You just come hop on there and follow on Instagram, and then you click the plus button, and we'll let you in. Be fun. Fuck yeah, absolutely, man. Count me in. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go and eat some dinner with my family. And if I, I'm gonna, so, so you going over to Instagram now in about an hour? About an hour and a half. Yeah, it's uh, what ten? What's? I sorry, time zones are all weird. Seven, eight. Uh, it'd be nine your time. So. Perfect. Yeah, that's about an hour before I'm gonna go on. So yeah, I'll swing through. 
awesome, why the hell? Man. That'd be fun. Yeah, it'll be great. And uh, yeah, I, I wrote a bunch of these songs down that now I have to listen to so that I can hear the influence. But I'm I'm super excited, man. I'm pumped to <laughs> I'm pumped to hear it. I love talking to people who are passionate about music. And uh, if anyone wants to find you, where can they find you? Where's the best place to get the music? Um, we are, um, all of the music, it's, it's the circle view and all of the music is available on Spotify, Apple music, anywhere you stream music, you can find it. If you would like to, um, because I still have from our last tour, I still have copies of uh, physical copies of CDs, um, available if you're old school, cause I'm, I'm getting those DMS now. If you're old school, find the, find the circle view on TikTok. And DM me and say, hey, man, I would like a, a copy of this album or this album on CD, and I will gladly send it to you free of charge. No problem. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, Lance, I'm excited to have you back on again and kind of watch this happen for you and see where it's going. Um, and listen to more of your music, man. Thank you so much, Wes, for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. You have been so instrumental um and my success on tiktok and i am grateful for you and i love you with all my heart man thank you yeah man i appreciate it all right well we'll we'll hop on again soon all right peace brother yeah all right everyone awesome interview with lance it was really good to see him really appreciate him hanging out um with us and you know Music is something that makes the world go round. You can check out Nikki uh, Pavlovich and myself do motivational music hour on TikTok every other Wednesday. Um, really fun time. Lance is there sometimes hopping in, listening to the music, jamming with us. It's a really good conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, until next time, I challenge you to find the shape of your success.